familiar with the residents nearest neighbouring village. If you're not, shout out now. Right, Nick. As a guide, this is a basic two-dimensional map on the top of most of the uh, slides. The name Dizzard has come down with many variations in spelling from the Latin desertum and probably refers to the retreat or dwelling of a hermit or a recluse. The main features are a large quarried area, which is um, an ancient parish church, <coughs> uh, a spectacular waterfall, and the remains of nearly 2,000 years of lead mining. <coughs> Two steep hills divide modern desert into upper and lower. Upper Dizzoth was mainly a product of the first half of the last century, whereas Lower Dizzoth, with the parish church, was mainly <coughs> earlier, prior to a fairly modern expansion of new estates. Dizzoth has an older history, which is not much in evidence, and except for the lead mining activity, was situated in Upper Dizzoth. <coughs> the summit of Mulgaradig, which is the hill area, which is the, um, if you go on to number three, I've got a photograph. Mm -hmm. the, this, there is the quarry. And this is the summit of Mulgaradi. It's quite big. I mean, that's that's the street along the side of the mountain. Um, it's the site of an Iron Age fort, which went more or less round the whole area. The quarry has removed the west end, but the east end. Um, as most details remain on that end. And you can see along the escarpments where there was a sort of wall, uh, stone walls built to keep people off. In 1872, fragments of a shield and sword were discovered. In 1954-55, in between 60 and 80, the excavations were conducted in advance of the quarry expansion. The strange thing about it was the quarry blew up and hit rocks, went all over the village, and they stopped quarrying soon afterwards. This is mentioned in Doomsday. The church and the presence of Frenchmen, possibly military retainers. As you probably know, Norman Rhythm had a mint. The lead mines of Dizzoth had since Roman times produced silver ores. In 1869 they were still producing 12 ounces of silver per tonne of lead. The silver probably provided Rhythm mint, which was for account for the French inhabitants of Dizzoth. Number four. Now, Dizzoth had a castle. That's actually Castle Hill, after it was quarried. That's a Gastino sketch of it, a couple of hundred years ago. That's the parish church. Greidbach is the hill there to the north end of Moherati. 
and it was built over earlier Neolithic and Bronze Age remains. Remember I said there was an earlier history of Joseph. Joseph Castle and Borough were founded by Henry III and given to Edward his son. The castle was destroyed years before all the conquering Edward I erected his castle and created his Rhythm Borough. In the 1990s I researched Joseph Castle visiting Chester to read and obtain copies of articles in the Chester Archaeological <coughs> Journals of the 1890s, Archaeological Cambrensis between 1930 and 1935. <coughs> These days look it up on a Society Facebook page or on YouTube directly. It's much easier. <laughs> The Gamma and Joseph Castle were given as a wedding present to Prince Edward on his marriage at the age of 15. The ruins of Shamba Wen, which is the only building left uh, near where the castle stood, that's the area where the burghers of Joseph once lived, the area of Trey Castle. Dizzard and de Gamma were built as part of Henry III's attempt to hold his ground against his nephew David. First mentioned in letters patent, 10th of May 1238, it was up and running by 1241. The death of David, March 1246, leaving no children, brought a period of relative tranquility to Dizzard. By the 12th of January, 1251, burrages were formed and granted. It was gifted to Prince Edward, 14th of February, 1254, with a charter dated 14th of April, 1254. It was first visited by Prince Edward on the 20th of July, 1256. As you can see what I've said Dizzoth was on its way up, with a future which looked safe. Prince Edward, who later as Edward I destroyed Welsh independence, was his protector. What could go wrong? Between 1255 and 1291, a lot happened as a result of conflicts of Henry III, <coughs> And after his death in November 1272, his son, the new king. Now this next bit's a little complicated. Edward's cousin Eleanor, daughter of his aunt Eleanor and Simon de Montfort, who was one of his father's enemies and is. Um, eventually became the wife their arch opponent Llewellyn the last, who was also the great nephew of Edward's other aunt, Joan, and John's daughter. I think I got that correct. <laughs> For Dizworth, not much occurred after the castle was stormed and destroyed by Llewellyn on the 4th of August 1263. History and extra, mainly the history of Rhythm. But apart from the fact a lot of useful debris from Joseph's Castle was recycled and used in the new construction as a new castle of Rhythm, Joseph remained a backwater. The castle remains <coughs> finally quarried away during World War I. Edward's success with regard to rhythm contrasted with Dizzard's failure after the destruction of the castle, and it highlights their very different futures. As Edward had come out on the winning side, his brother of Dizzard was still in existence in 1291, when the earliest lay subsidy roll lists 12 as taxable, with amounts paid for in Dizzard's village. Ask 
add to the list nine taxable in trader castle castle town a total of 21. this may be a quite a small number compared with the 75 listed for Rizman in the same year. It's noticeable most of the Dizzle's names are Welsh, whereas the Rhythm ones were not. Earlier Welsh landowners had been forced to sell their holdings in the burial, and a large percentage of Rhythm Street holders worked on the construction of the castle. By 1407, only a handful of freeholders were named in the tax returns, and one, that of Cunrig at Blathing at Maddock, is a known ancestor of people who will be mentioned later tonight. He spent some time as a prisoner in Rhythland Castle, suspected of being a Lollard, an early precursor of the Revolution. Uh, sorry. The Reformation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the next page. Yeah, uh, now, if we can sing. Oh, sorry, that's that's from 1891. Um, a, car, a picture of the castle as it was sketched. Yes, yeah, six. <clears throat> Prior to the railway opening for freight on the 1st of September 1869, goods were mainly moved in and out of the area by the port of Rhythland. From 1903 to 1930, there was also a passenger service until the more convenient Trussell bus service superseded it. There were spurs to the Dizzoth main quarry and, um, and Talibroth lead mining mines and also there was a spurt to the castle when, <coughs> while, the, while the quarry was in operation. <coughs> An extension was planned to the circle round Moyle Harathi um, via Marion Mills, which that was how it looked a few years ago. To, towards Newmarket and on via Coombe back to the station at Dizzoth going right round the, the large hill. The groundworks built in 1884 can be seen for about a mile as far as Marion Mills but never went any further and were never built on. The quarry at Dizzoth has recently been put up for sale and in the description it's noted that some of the stone was used to build a castle on the outskirts of the village in the 1240s, which gives you an idea how long the quarry had been going, which was destroyed in the 1260s. It doesn't go on to say that the same stone was recycled for use at Rhythm in the 1280s. As well as limestone quarry, Moyle contained various metal mines, iron, manganese, nickel, and in the late 19th century, a cobalt mine, unique in Britain at that time. The second feature I mentioned was the parish church, the great. Oh, that's the quarry as it was in... Uh, 1912. I'm missing, sorry, I've been missing things. Um, so the next one now, please. Number eight. This is the second feature I mentioned was the ancient parish church. The main internal features 
an almost complete medieval Jesse window and there remains a stone cross preserved in the nave. Witchcraft which disturbed the tenor of life in the 17th century. Its origins in arising from disputes regarding pews in the church. The churchyard contains some hooded tombs. Mentioned last year by David Richards. But the above all centred around the Hughes family, <coughs> Flewerton and Treycastle were also very much involved in the development of lead mines. The Hughes family were the descendants of the Conway Gap Blazing at Maddock, mentioned earlier in the 1407 tax roll. Though I have no proof, it's my opinion that these two very similar looking hooded tombs next to each other are possibly those of Ralph Hughes and his son Ebul. I could try and check, but I base my opinion in that these two ornate structures side by side are probably theirs as they died within a few years of each other in 1660 and 1667 respectively. When I saw them over 70 years ago, they're in, as you can see, they're in a lot better condition than they are now. Ralph claimed family possession of the lead mine area, dating back to 1573. <coughs> At the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, earlier than that, they were owned by Sir John Conway of Bedrothen. Ralph's involvement in witchcraft is twofold. As a JP, he examined witnesses in February 1665 regarding the acquisition, accusation of witchcraft against Dorothy Griffith Picton, sent for trial at Flint Assizes. He had personal experience, and this his father-in-law, John Wynne Edwards, backed by four witnesses, accused Henry John James of witchcraft going back as far as 1625, he was accused of the Court of Arches in 1638. Behind the accusation, accusation is the background of a long-standing family feud between Ralph and a distant family member Henry of Harry Gregor II of Flanata over a pew in Dizeth Church. These were powerful, well-landed gentry. Henry of Harry's family, over a hundred years later, had purchased Bathingburg Abbey in 1540, at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. And Ralph Hughes at one time was High Sheriff of Flintshire. The two of them had a common great-great-grandfather, William Ithel, but not in the sons of the next generation. The consistency court of St. Asaph in 1591 had given judgment in favour of Ralph's grandfather. With more disputes in the Star Chamber during the reign of James, not helped by William Hughes, the father of Ralph, in 1634, buying land alerted off the brother of his adversity, Henry up Harry Gregor II. Henry John James, the one who was accused, had been a witness for Henry up Harry Gregor II against Ralph. <coughs> so I think the witchcraft was a bit made up. He was supposed to have made cows sick. <laughs> such like. The next generation saw the breakup of Ralph's family. After Edward's death in 1667, there was a dispute regarding his estate between the husband of his daughter Judith and his brother John. 
settled in 1674 in John Saver, the Court of Chancery. In 1681, he leased the lead mines to Roger Whitley, Whiteley, sorry, and the estate was divided. Colonel Roger Whiteley, 1618-1697, was a royalist hero of the Civil War, with personal contact with both Charles I and his son Charles II. His involvement with Dizeth came later when living at Dizeth Hall. He operated, operated the lead mines till his death. His daughter then leased them out for 10 years, from 1699, to the Welsh Copper Company. But they passed from local control on her marriage to the Earl of Plymouth in 1705. When I lived in Dizeth as a young child, I think I knew two of the family members who were then alive. They were descended from the Kimmel Estate branch of the Hughes family after 1681. There were riots connected with the lead mines where shots were fired in 1850 outside the home of the mine manager at Dizeth Hall, now Dizeth Hall Farm, that's on the back road to Rome. In September 1883 the mine was auctioned. In May 1884 because of underground flooding, the lead mines, <coughs> underground work ceased, with ore on the surface being processed till 1905. In 1945, Italian prisoners of war were employed dumping wire into the mine shafts. That would be um, barbed wire from the war. 1960, the derelict site was cleared and the mine shafts were sealed. Not all of them, because some rather untidy scouser, somewhere in the 1970s and 80s, dropped his wife down one after he murdered her. <laughs> Unfortunately, a handbag stuck on the way down and it was spotted and he was arrested very fast. But, um, Johnson, in his tour of Britain visited the waterfalls and the sluice gates were open to show its full glory. Another visited to them in the 19th century was Garibaldi, visiting Rhodes during his exile from Italy, which he spent in London. That was reported in the Royal Journal at the time. Uh, could we go to Sorry. <laughs> Number nine is a post office. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I'm sorry about this. I lost the list, so I got it back this afternoon. This photograph of this post office is personal memories for me. It's a source of extra pocket money. Several years after the end of World War II, the government ran a scheme to reduce the number of moles overrunning the fields of Britain. For each mole taken to the local post office, you were paid threepence or sixpence. To be honest, I can't remember. I think it was sixpence, but that seems quite a large sum post-war. Our cat was always bringing them home to that house. One day she brought three. The postmaster commented, that's 12 today. Knowing that some waterproof clothing was made of, or at least cold, called moleskin, I asked if they were sent away. His reply was, they go in the bin. <laughs> that evening, when all was quiet, I went around the back and took him out of his bin. <laughs> I gave them a wash. <laughs> Next day I went a mile or so to Coombe Post Office and got an excellent second windfall. <laughs> Listening in school afterwards. Excuse me. Right. 
Excuse me. Don't undress him. <laughs> Did anyone miss him? Sorry about this, technical hazard. <laughs> 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 All in there every day. <laughs> Can you hear it needs pairing again, Barry. Out, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, audience. <laughs> now you've got some knowledge of the layout of the village. Shout out if you can't hear. I'll show you some views of the lower village. <coughs> now that is the waterfall hill. It's pretty oh, yeah. steep. Yes. I can remember when the bus is going up, they used to make you get off at the bottom <laughs> if there was ice and join us at the top again. Um, this is behind the waterfalls, the river comes through. That has gone now. There's caves there, the lead mines. Funny story I heard of one of the councillors in discipline. They're having a debate about the land and who owned the waterfalls and such like. And Lord Langford's representative came along to the meeting. And he said, oh, you know, what belongs to the estate? And it turned out that some old gentleman who lived here at some time had left that little bit to the parish council. <laughs> and it rather got up. Yes. <laughs> the agent uh, uh, knows, but um, and those are originally weavers' cottages. Yeah. They're just round the corner there, where the hill goes up again on that side. And um, obviously, there was weaving done in the. Uh, the old now, if you can have number 11. Now, this is Upper Dizzeth. Um, that is Marion Mills. Now, that is where the whole of Dizzeth and Frustatin's water supply comes from that stream. There's a pumping house near where the station was in Dizzeth. And it, to supply Prestatin and Dizzeth, that's why they've got very hard water uh, compared with Rizal and Rill. But that, that's one of the biggest flows of water, I think, anywhere in the country. That is Moyle Hiradig with the, well, you can't see the quarry there. Um, that was the house that I bought in 1969 and lived to, till um, 2014. 
when the hills started to get in my heart. Um, this was taken from the top of the bridge that used to cross the road going from the quarry to the works. And if you look there, there's a, the, it was the um, congregation church. That house there, it was a shop and a house. And that's where I was evacuated to between 1939 and 1945. I went back. It was a relation aunt of mine so that's why I didn't uh, all the other evacuees were scousers <laughs> but I came from Manchester um, my parents had been married in Dizzle Church in 1931 so that's how the connection was up there but that's looking down from the quarry down the high street it's about there is the post office as I showed you Anyway, a few final snippets about the village. On the 11th of January 1942, the last bomb dropped in North Wales fell on Dizzard. Sir John Horton, son of a Royal Grammar School teacher, was born in a house on Coombe Road and he became the Director General of the Met Office in 1984. I know that because when we got the message saying that, I got a rollicking off his father once. It's <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite, quite impressed the people in the, in the Met Office. Um, e. Neverson, author of Medieval Castles in North Wales, a study of sites, water supply and building stones. From 1947, it was a definitive work on the subject for the next 50 years. Before I close, I'd like to relate a rather, I think it's uncanny tale regarding myself. As I explained, I was evacuated to Dizzeth in 1939. Returning to Manchester in 1945, but returning to Dizzeth in 1947 as a resident until 2014. During my pre-teen years, when I was back in Dizzeth, I used to dream, daydream, as most kids do, but my, I had a recurring dream that the war had gone differently and the German camp was at Kimmel. There was a resistance, which was successful, based on a tunnel below Moyle Rally. This was probably a combination of being evacuated there playing in the Anderson shelter in Manchester amongst the bomb sites <coughs> when I went back to Manchester the play being about fighting Germans you know, as it was in those days and then returning to, to Dizzeth old enough to explore the area I grew up and for about 60 years never thought any more about it could put number 12 on In 2009, a short article came out in the Dizzard Times, copies displayed before you. I'll read it to you. Some years ago, a regular contributor, Danny, was in conversation with one of the elders of the community and asked about the cave or tunnel entrance he had spotted on the side of Moirade, whether hewn entirely by hand or simply enlarged. It clearly bore the work, marks of some work by mankind. The elder, perhaps perpetuating a local joke on an incomer, or maybe in all seriousness, said it was the entrance to a tunnel the legend said ran through under the mountain. Unsure whether his leg was being pulled or not, Danny filed the tale away for later investigation. On a subsequent walk round the other side of Hirari, he spotted another entrance, which had been sealed off by means of an iron grill, and became <coughs> even more intrigued. Was this, he wondered, the other end of this original tunnel? Were these simply exploratory digs, partway into the hillside, by quarrymen in times past? 
shelters for those digging on the hill in even more ancient times, or perhaps even evidence of Roman exploratory mining. As is the way with these things, Danny took a few pictures and tried to remember who it was that had told him the original tale. But memory failed him. At this point, he discussed the holes in the hillside with a number of people, some of whom are now sadly beyond asking. This is in 1909, 2009, sorry. <laughs> now, we don't want anyone going off to crawl in the caves. It doesn't, it just goes on a bit more. I'd never heard anything on the subject. My only assumption is that in 1943-44, I must subconsciously have heard of it being talked out about in Dizzeth School. But I hope the information on Dizzeth and the stories about living there as a child have helped pass this winter evening. Thank you for listening and any questions. <coughs> You haven't mentioned anything about pubs in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> You haven't mentioned anything about pubs. in the uh, desert or uh, drinking uh, water holes. Uh, <laughs> all four of them. <laughs> well, I was thrown out of the cross keys on my 18th birthday. <laughs> when my mate was a month older, so the landlord said, What are you boys celebrating today? And he turned around and says, it's his 18th birthday and we've been drinking there for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I'll tell you anymore. <laughs> no, it's a... It's, a, it's a different... Sorry. Um, when you're saying about the rocks going everywhere in the quarry, yeah. I do know a neighbour next door that wants me worked in the quarry he actually got killed there with one of the rocks that hit him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was quite a few years ago, obviously. Yeah, well, I, we drove... He died one of the rocks in yeah. one of the... One landed, one landed in the, on the top of the classroom in the school. Yeah. Yes. And they, yeah. they went right down to Coon Road, the other, mm. the other yeah. end. But <laughs> Maureen and I had just driven down the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. we were driving down. We'd heard a bang, but you know, and there was bits of stuff all scattered all over the roads. Yeah. And we were going to realize that some lot had shed its load. Mm -hmm. We went off and we didn't hear anything about it until we got back. Him, yeah. yeah. Can I just but, tell sorry. you? Sorry, I, I was teaching in a school for Adig at the time oh, on yeah? that day, mm -hmm. amongst many others. You probably taught Jane. Jane Hatch. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was in the last room on that wing, yeah. and it was just before playtime, so it was about half past ten, and we were clearing up and ready to to sit down for me to tell the story before they went out. And uh, these rocks came through the window, <laughs> and one of them landed. I'd got a corner. We had beds for children to. Uh, rest on from the nursery. There was just one there playing house. Mm. And the little girl had been lying on that two minutes before she cleared. But another, only one was hurt with these that came through. And that was, I don't remember her name now, but she hurt her elbow. Mm. And so she had to be uh, bandaged up and taken to hospital. At least you know it's not false news. <laughs> <laughs> and the other little bit on that one, uh, John who works, they own the uh, Bainal Bower Hotel. They, uh, he was in my class and uh, I took them out because most of the, of the rocks came over into the junior wing down at the bottom and uh, Mr Roberts, who was the head, had gone straight down there to see what was happening. He hadn't thought that they'd come in at the top. And ITV and BBC were there before they came to see where they were. <laughs> and I was sitting in the, the toilet on the floor of the child in the corridor between the toilets mm -hmm. and the classes. And this little boy said to me, they were sitting there, cross legs, big eyes, 
I'm a very good boy, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and he well, is now off as we free rip the swims in his uh, swimming pool. <laughs> he was one hell of a bang. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I remember it as well, because I'm from Dizzeth originally. I was went to the school. Yeah. And I I was only a little kid then when it went through the way through this room. Really? What's your name? Dunster. Oh god, there are lots of Dunsters. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a man with us. My brother in used to work yeah. in the quarry. Yes. So I remember the quarry so I used to take about the sandwiches. Right. Where the quarry was working. Yeah. Mm. And we jumped on the train for a free ride to Pistatin. <laughs> you still haven't told me what your name was. Dunstan, uh, Ralph Dunstan. Dunstan. Oh, yeah, Ralph. Ralph, yes. Yeah. Dunstan. <laughs> I was saying because I had the twins, mm -hmm. you? Yes. yes. Crystal and Clive. Yes. Mm -hmm. I found the boys. <laughs> 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 and he showed us um, yeah. all, all, of, all over Dizzard. That was my playground. All the way. Yes, yes, Can I just say that if anybody's interested in old photographs of Dissert, I do a website, dissert.com, and there's over a thousand old pictures on there. Thank you for Thank you, Mike. our money's worth out of you over the last couple of months because if you remember uh, Mike was the speaker in December as well. Um, he talked about Rutland that night. Uh, Dizzeth, where are we going next Mike? Home. <laughs> the King's Head. We could probably, yeah. He could probably write a lot about home but we won't go there. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, are you ready Mr Raffle? That's it, I'll take right. the staff speaking a minute. Thank <laughs> you.